Good evening everybody. My name is Paula McMahon and I'll chair this evening's event. Uh, I'm also chair of Engineering Together and Engineering Together and WES volunteers are who has very kindly organised uh, this event. So thanks to everyone uh, for attending tonight. Um, we do have people attending from all over the world. Um, we would like you to engage with the chat function so even though you'll be on mute for the duration of the event uh, you can engage with us using that chat function and we will do questions and answers throughout. These may be limited in time because we have a lot of speakers to get through and we will look at the speakers in pairs um, apart from our very special guest who will do a slot at the end. If we do have more questions and answers than we have time, we will be having a stay back session and a little networking session after the formal close at six. So that's our um, agenda for the for the evening. It's quite um, a, a tight uh, timetable. So we are at lightning speakers. So each of our ladies will be speaking for quite a short length of time, but that's to get across as many aspects of diversity within the engineering field as we can. So if we go to our first set of speakers and I'll introduce Dr. Jo Douglas Harris. Uh, she's heavily involved in WES. She is a scientist at Venator and straight after Jo will speak to Gabby who is uh, our marine engineer. Uh, she's in, she works as a steel outfit and designer in the shipbuilding industry. So without further ado, over to Jo. Thanks Paula. If you could just go on to the next slide, please. So I thought I'd start with this slide. Um, I've been a volunteer with WES for about five years now, but I quite often feel like a bit of an imposter talking to groups of engineers. When I was at school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after school. And then um, I just decided at university to do the subject that I liked best, and that was chemistry. When I finished my PhD, uh, finished my degree, sorry, I still wasn't really sure what I wanted to be when I was a grown up and thought I'd put off being a grown up and, and do a PhD and uh, looked for something in um, a more applied area of chemistry and just happened to end up in engineering. And um, it was at that point that I realised that I actually probably would have been better suited to doing that all along. And um, if you just go on to the next slide, please. So because of that, I got involved um, with a group of students setting up a women's engineering society at the University of Bath. And uh, amongst the various activities that we we did as a group one of the big things that we focused on was doing activities with young people in local schools to let them know about careers in stem and in engineering specifically and um, i don't think that all young people should be engineers but i think they all need to have the knowledge to make those informed decisions and it, it is something that i feel i didn't have um, when i was it when i was that age next slide please When I went into my first job after my PhD, it was a job in manufacturing. And what I realised was um, what I'd been doing up to that point was really linked to diversity. It was all about getting a diverse group of young people interested in engineering and going into those sectors. And um, what I quickly learned was that that's um, great, but it's maybe not the whole story and um, I think my early experiences in, in engineering were not so great. If you could go on to the next slide, please. And I think those bad experiences lead us to the leaky pipeline. So we get some girls in at the beginning, still not quite enough, but then we lose them at school, at university, maybe when they um, take maternity leave or when they hit the glass ceiling. Um, and so actually what we need to think about as well as diversity is inclusion. We need to make the workplaces somewhere that these people all want to stay, not just uh, not just starting. Next slide, please. So this is where WES really comes in. Um, it's a charity and professional networking body of women, engineers, scientists and technologists, the largest network of female engineers in the UK, with the aims of promoting the education of women in engineering and making sure that the public know about women in engineering and really um, as a charity, WES focuses on that 18 plus, the, the women who've already made the decision to go into engineering to 
try and keep them there and make it a place that they do want to stay. Next slide, please. So what do WES do to support their members? First off, we have our WES student groups, which is how I got involved in WES in the first place. Next up, networking events like this one, uh, national or local events, um, different clusters around the country organise different things. Uh, next up, we have volunteering opportunity. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, volunteering opportunities. So that's um, on one of our boards, our university groups board, our apprentices board or our uh, early careers board or the board of trustees. Um, but also other volunteering opportunities like writing for our journal or judging a set of awards. Um, and the last thing on this slide is our conferences. We normally, in a normal year, we run a student conference and um, a, a WES members conference. Um, and we've also run apprentice conferences as well. And that's to really support the CPD of our members. Next slide, please. We're also really keen to look to the future, but also celebrate our past. In terms of looking forward, we have mentors at our mentoring program. And we're also quite heavily involved in STEM Returners, which is a programme designed to get STEM professionals of any gender who've had a break from their work in STEM back into careers in STEM and trying to fix that leaky pipeline. The other thing on this slide is our centenary trail map. Um, over the last year for our centenary year, we've been adding or getting volunteers to add Wikipedia pages on female engineers and trying to change that imbalance um, in terms of gender on Wikipedia. Next slide, please. We also celebrate women engineers. That's why we're all here today. Um, INWED was launched six years ago, International Women in Engineering Day. And we use that as an opportunity to just showcase the amazing women that we have working in engineering and the amazing work that they do. As part of that, um, I think it's four years ago, we started the We 50 that's celebrating the top 50 women in engineering this year with a theme on a uh, theme of top 50 women in sustainability. And last up on this slide, we've got Wes Lottie Tour, where Wes members take a photo with a Lottie doll at work and uh, they can then show them on social media. And hopefully lots of young people will see the huge range of careers available within engineering. Next slide, please. So what can you do after today? First of all, be a champion for diversity and inclusion. You need them both. You can't do one without the other. Use whatever influence you have to help that leaky pipeline. Whatever point you can help women and other minorities leaving the profession it, it is really, really important. Attend other InWed events. This year, we have a really unique opportunity and that we can go to events all over the globe because they're nearly all virtual. <laughs> um, and finally, use social media to spread the word. The official hashtags of the day are there. Um, and if you'd like to get in touch, uh, get more involved in WES locally or nationally, I've just popped my email address on there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jo. So over to Gabby. You're on mute, Gabby. Um, I'm doing right then. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much, Paula, for the lovely introduction and for inviting me to this event. It is much appreciated. Um, I grew up, studied, and partially practiced my job in Romania, where the engineering profession is well appreciated amongst girls and, and young women. Um, but coming in 2007 in UK, um, I embark on many challenges and to number few is the gender imbalance, but the biggest one was uh, the language barrier as I learned English language later in my career. But here I am now, I manage them, I pass them. Um, I become citizen um, in 2013 and this year I embarked to another two challenges, a new job position at Camelard and a new membership with the newly founded Rina Northwest branch. So we shouldn't be afraid of challenges, we'll learn a lot from them. Um, but coming back at my arrival in UK, 
one of the things I must wonder about was why here it's a such small number of British women in engineering. Uh, so as can be seen from the photograph, in 2017, I was the only female member in Rosite. Um, and I'm still the only one at Camelair now. I ask around, I look for literature. I was looking on the website and next slide, please. And I discovered that the British women have a huge potential for engineering, which was firstly unveiled during the Great War when they step in in the ammunition industry to, re to replace the men. And they've been highly encouraged and supported by the government. Um, but after the war, during the very unstable uh, social environment, the government changed the attitude and the women haven't took this um, so easy. But they created, they created on 23rd of June, 1919, the Women Engineering Society. And today, after 101 years of continuous activities, the next slide presents the outcomes. Next slide, please. Now, we have more ladies in engineering covering all ethnical groups and they are from covering all levels as well from apprentice engineering to the highest levels of management so there is hope um, and next slide please and i will encourage all young girls and women wish they have a technical abilities, please expand your horizon, search for opportunities, follow your passion and discover engineering. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. Alex, I don't believe we've got any questions and answers yet. Anybody... Yeah, we don't have any. So if anyone's got any type in really quick oh, one's come through will it be possible to get the slides and the link to the recording to share with colleagues i do believe this is being recorded are slides going to be shared at the end paula uh we will put them on the engineering together youtube and i will send uh, all attendees afterwards a link to that over the next couple of days okay Eric? yeah if anyone's got any questions just type them um through as people are speaking and we'll like um, bring it up on the question and answer slots. So I think we should move on to the next set of speakers then, and then we can uh, leave us time at the end for a more comprehensive question and answer session or discussion. So with no further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our next two speakers. So we've got Zoe Lewis, who is the principal and CEO of Middlesbrough College, and she's been there since 2013. In that short length of time, she's made huge changes. She's become an inspirational leader of the year, and uh, you'll see from her presentation how diverse um, the courses are at Middlesbrough College. We also have Nicola Hill. Nicola's a senior transport planner at Arup and uh, Nicola's got a geography degree. You'll see from the introductions of all the people, we've all got very different degrees and we work in very different sectors. And uh, Nicola is a very important member of our highways and transportation um, member of Without further ado, I'll hand over to Zoe Lewis. Hi everybody, I'm guessing that you'll see me as soon as I start speaking. I haven't seen myself come up yet, but uh, evening everybody. Um, so yeah, so I've actually been at the college for 15 years. Oh, I've been yeah, I've been principal for seven. Um, and my, my career started a little bit differently to, to the standard route that people might expect in that I dropped out of my A-levels, not because I found them too challenging really, but because I was eager to learn at work. And so I, I took the alternative apprenticeship style route and I've worked from the age of 16. And I actually attended Middlesbrough College on an evening 
for six years until I became a qualified accountant, actually two years quicker than had I taken a university route, um, carried on uh, doing my master's degree part time as well. Um, so and I think that that different educational route has really influenced a lot of what we're trying to achieve at the college in terms of making um, the careers more relevant to work making sure that people have as much opportunity for work experience as possible so they can apply their learning in the workplace, which we really think um, enhances uh, people's knowledge and, and experiences and skills. Um, so I'm doing something a little bit different um, this evening because I know we've got a lot of light, light, lightning speakers. So I've prepared a little video which hopefully just summarises in three minutes the journey the college has been on. Um, we do cover all sectors of the economy and we do cover entry-level courses all the way up to master's degrees um, but we have put a particular emphasis over the last seven or eight years on STEM subjects on really encouraging diversity um, giving really good careers advice and trying to shift the career uh, decisions that people make and particularly young people and hopefully this video gives you a little bit of a flavour of that. <laughs> of a flavour of where we've been trying to target our efforts really and we have uh, as I say doubled a lot of the engineering courses that we've got the, the diverse nature of the students that we have on those courses and and that's been successful to a degree and I've noticed a couple of questions come up on that which I'll probably touch on at the end. Um, looking forward there's three three main planks to our future strategy one is um, the T in STEM is the area that we've done the least on. So we've done a lot around science, a lot around engineering, a lot around mathematics, 
um, but we haven't done enough around technology and, and never has there been a time when digital skills and digital curriculum uh, are as important as they are now. Um, and it is a fast growing uh, business as we can all testament to as we're all on a virtual uh, seminar as we speak. So we've got a big agenda around digital, uh, working with Andy Preston, Middlesbrough Council on some of their investments and working around T levels as well, which I'll come on to in a second. If you just move on to the, the next slide there. So linking to digital, on the next slide, you'll see that a key part of our strategy is T-levels and T-levels are supposed to be technical equivalents of A-levels. And I say supposed to be because the government's idea is that technical qualifications need to have parity of esteem with academic qualifications. And that's what these T-levels are aimed to achieve. And um, the key difference is there's more exam assessment at the end and there's a significant industrial placement. So we've been piloting these T-levels for two years now and they involve generally students coming into college three days a week, going into the workplace for two days a week. And I started off summarising my pathway, my academic and, and career pathway. And it's very much a way that I believe really helps you learn, helps the employers see the potential of young people, um, helps young people get that mix of work experience as well to supplement their learning. So we're excited for that. They come on board for real next year and digital T-level is one of the first so we're looking to expand our campus around project-based learning where local employers give a project to our students to work on alongside their studies. And then the final plank on the last slide is Institute of Technology. You may have seen it already, it's just gone into the press this week. The little light grey bit at the end there that you can see on the image, that's an extension to our STEM centre. So our STEM centre is very technical huge process plan, advanced manufacturing, logistics, um, mechanical engineering. This is a higher education centre where we'll house all our HMC students, our HND students, some of our degree students as well. So they can apply their academic knowledge, working up through that pathway to degree level, but in a technical environment where they can actually see in practice the sorts of things that they'll be doing um, in industry if they aren't already working part time at the same time. So they're three of the, pl the planks and the strategies that we've got moving forward. I think I'm about out of time and I'm happy to take those questions. Thank you. There's a summary of what we're about, yeah. And if we take the questions for Zoe after Nicola's done hers and then we'll yeah. do that together, that would be great. Great. Hello everybody, hopefully you can hear me. I'm not sure you can see me. I'll just switch my screen on. There we are, so hopefully you can see me now. Hello everybody, my name's Nicola Hill. Um, I work for our up and our tagline, uh, we shape a better world, fits quite well with this evening's events tagline, um, shaping the world by influence and inclusion. Uh, a bit about me, I'm from the North East, from Stockton. Um, I have, as Paul had mentioned earlier, geography background. And I started my career in transport planning at JMP Consultants, where I was heavily involved in accessibility assessments, which was one of the first projects um, was, for example, looking at access to maternity units, and it made me realise how important transport and highway profession can be. Um, in terms of it, transport can be a real barrier to many people, particularly those without access to a car, and those um, tend to be, uh, a higher proportion of those tend to be women or those from socially deprived groups. So it, it makes you realise quite soon how, how important transport can be. Um, I joined Arup in 2007, uh, where I also um, got a master's in our postgraduate certificate in GIS and science. I've become a chartered transport planning professional. Um, I've been on the board of the Transport Planning Society and I'm currently the North East and Cumbria uh, chair of the Chartered Institute of Highways and Transportation, um, which is why I also sit on the Engineering Together group as a CIHT representative. And personally, I've got a husband, a daughter and a couple of cats at home as well. Uh, next slide, please. So a bit about my workplace, I work at Arup, um, in terms of some headline stats in 2019, they had 37% female uh, workforce, 7% black and minority ethnic background, and 3% of the workforce class themselves as lesbian, gay, bisexual or another. Um, for me personally, I think it's a fairly inclusive place to work. Um, some of the things Arup have done or are, are doing, um, First image shows our Respect at Work campaign, which uh, is a toolkit and there's mandatory e-learning training as well for every member of staff. Um, the second image is an inclusion pledge, uh, which has started quite recently, where we're being asked to develop four or five behaviour 
behaviours that we expect from one another to help towards the wider goal of being a more inclusive place to work. Uh, the next couple of images are just from our internet site and they show the Connect forums, um, for example, Connect Women, Connect Cultures, uh, Connect Out. Um, for example, the Connect Women's vision is to be a professional inclusive network that improves opportunities for women in Arab to enable them to maximise their valued contribution to the firm, our clients and our industry. So they're very useful, these forums. Um, they uh, send emails on things uh, like religious holidays. The Connect Cultures might send an email just about the background about the holiday so that you understand uh, that the whole firm is getting this information to understand different cultures. Similarly, the Connect Women uh, Forum may send emails about things. And it's all really just to promote diversity within the firm. Um, the next image is for anyone familiar with Big Brother is the online diary room chair and um, within Arup there was an anonymous um, area online where employees could report any, any issues they were having anonymously and they would then be reviewed, um, the, the issues would then be reviewed um, to take into consideration aspects that people might not feel comfortable talking about in person but so that they could report any concerns that they had. Um, and the last image is just really to show for me personally, I find that Arup supports my work-life balance. Um, they have a very good maternity policy to encourage women um, on their return to work and um, they have things like childcare vouchers, uh, flexible work. And obviously we're all working from home at the moment anyway, um, but generally it's, they've been very supportive. Um, I work part-time and I find it works relatively well for me and um, things are busy, but they have a very transparent appraisal process. And we have a good mentoring scheme as well. So we're meant, we have mentors um, and people we can speak to who aren't necessarily our line managers. So again, if we were having any concerns at work um, in terms of diversity and, and any issues we had, um, we would be able to report those without having to go directly to our, to our line manager. And in terms of the industry and my professional institution, um, CIHT support Women in Engineering Day. They have a social media campaign where they ask members to provide reasons why they chose a career in transportation to try and inspire others to consider careers in the industry. And um, there's podcasts available on the website. Um, the image on the bottom left is me doing my bit for International Women's Day uh, a couple of years ago at Teesside University, um, where we had a stall and we spoke to students and encouraged them um, to consider a, a career in, in highways and transportation. I have a very supportive local committee, as I say, I'm chair of the regional branch and it's good because I then have quite a bit of influence on what the institution in the North East and Cumbria can focus on. Um, coming from a, uh, as a, from a female background, you, you can then kind of uh, look at things that may, may not have, uh, others may not have thought to look at. So I have a bit of influence there and it's, it's nice to be able to use that for the two years that I'm chair. Um, the local committee are uh, very supportive of me and we've, we've had quite a few female chairs in the past. Um, and in terms of uh, for anybody interested in how transport planning and the profession can play a significant role in reducing inequality and improving inclusion, um, there is further reading out there, the Invisible Woman book, I've put the image there, um, that was by Caroline Perez and that highlights really the gender bias in transport planning decisions and a lot in a lot of other areas of life as well. But in terms of just basic things like um, in transport planning, we tend to focus on commuter trips and invest in roads, and they tend to have a high percentage of male users, but we maybe don't focus so much on other transport, such as the bus, which has a higher proportion of female users. Um, and I was reading a chapter the other night just on how, you know, generally um, car manufacturers use male crash test dummies, which has had a real impact on the safety of women in vehicles, and you're much more likely as a woman to suffer um, serious injury or death than uh, a male just for that basis. Um, so it really emphasises the need to challenge some existing trends, things that we may not necessarily think about, but um, which are actually having effect on women in the industry. Um, so that's quite an, an interesting read. And as I say, it covers other areas, not just highways and transportation, but it does bring some interesting um, thoughts uh, to, the, to the perspective. Um, and I think that's it from me. Those are the images, as I say, we're just really to focus on um, how, how we can challenge um, some of the existing trends in the industry. Uh, next slide. And I think that's it from me. Thank you, Nicola. If Laura Brown from Wes, are you going to take the, the couple of questions? Okay. Thank you, Zoe and Nicola. Those are very interesting presentations. Um, we've had a number of questions. Um, if everyone can hear me okay number of interesting questions, one about the T-levels 
and um, how, if there have been any feedback yet on how they have been performing or what is the evaluation of them? Yeah, um, obviously we're getting, this is a pilot study at the moment, so we've had 400 students out this year in, in health, in construction, in digital placements. Um, obviously finding placements from employers isn't always easy, um, but as I say, we have managed to get 400. We're getting great feedback from employers, to be honest, because they're there more, they get to know them more, they can do more meaningful things with students. If you're just on a 10-day placement, you feel like by the time they get into the swing of something, you're going to lose them. And so they end up photocopying and making the tea or watching and, and really doing those sort of, you know, it's experience is better than nothing, but it's not as good as an extended placement where they can really get the teeth into a particular project or a scheme. And they know they're going to be there on Monday and Tuesday every week. And I noticed that Jessica's mentioned, I mean, Atkins have been great this year taking T-level students. So um, I think it'd be nice to gather employer feedback as well. We get it, but it would be nice to do it more formally as well. Um, from employers who've taken them but the feedback we've been getting is um, is that they much prefer them um, and that they they can do a lot more with them so it benefits both parties I think there is a worry that it might take away from apprenticeships longer term um, but I think we haven't seen that yet um, I think there's a whole different worry around apprenticeships at the moment with COVID-19 but but that is something that that we need to watch carefully. There was a, a question um from Alex about uh, to um, to Nicola there about which forum is best, and I think that you're talking about the Arab forums that um, that that you utilise at Arab. Mm -hmm. Which forum is have you found most useful? Well, like I said, I can only speak um, on my perspective in terms of the Connect Women forum. Um, but I suppose in terms of what's more useful is probably the ones that you don't know so much about. So I personally really enjoy reading about the Connect cultures. As I say, we get emails about um, different religious holidays and, and it just widens, you know, you think you know things, but until um, you sent kind of information um, about the maybe it's different holidays or different cultures, I think that's probably more useful. But yeah, you kind of, I, I guess even I'm guilty of focusing more on uh, the connect women and the ones that I'm interested in rather than perhaps the, the ones that I know less about. Mm 